and welcome to the evening services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, August the 22nd. Uh, we again are virtual by uh, via YouTube, so I hope that uh, all of you are able to uh, get on and uh, worship with us this Sunday evening. We will be singing songs from Songs of Faith and Praise. I hope you have a copy of it with you and you're able to sing along with us. And so if you would uh, pick up your songbook and uh, turn to hymn number 148, we will get started. 148. <clears throat> I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over, and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Oh, that was good. Uh, would you turn your song books to uh, song number 183? 183. Lord of all being, throned afar, thy glory flames from sun and star, center and soul of every sphere, yet to each loving heart how near. Son of our life, thy quickening ray sheds on our path a glow of day. Star of our hope, thy sovereign light cheers the long watches of the night. Our midnight is thy smile withdrawn. Our noontide is thy gracious dawn. Our rainbow arch thy mercy sign. All save the clouds of sin are thine. And before we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, turn your songbooks to number 359. We'll sing all three verses and then save the chorus for the end. Okay, three verses and then the chorus for the end. 
I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, his dear life he freely gave. From realms above, Jesus freely came to die, that I might live someday with him on high. I love the Lord, for he saved the lost from sin. He gave them life to be whole and free again. To live on high, with him never more to die. Oh, praise his name. We'll see him by and by. I love the Lord for his love so full and free. He taught us why that our love like his should be. To be like him and compassion freely give. Oh, bless his name, we then with him could live. I love the Lord, he has been so good to me. He gave his life from sin to set me free. No greater love than his could ever be. I love the Lord because he first loved me. When we think of the sentiments of this song, uh, we sing about... Uh, our loving the Lord because he died my soul to save. Uh, he saved the lost from sin. Uh, Jesus freely came to die that I might someday live with him. And so we gather about the Lord's table remembering that, uh, echoing the words that we just sang in this song. Uh, and we just think uh, of how much we love the Lord for what he was willing to go through for each one of us. That uh, he hung on the cross, he suffered a cruel death, reserved for the worst of the worst kinds of people, uh, of which he certainly was not. And uh, he did that for you and he did that for me. And so we are instructed as a memorial to this each Lord's Day that we allow a certain amount of time within our worship service to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us, that he gave up his body, that he shed his blood, that uh, we might have our sins forgiven and that we may one day live with him. So uh, let's first pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to have his body racked with pain, uh, nails driven in his hands and his feet, a uh, sword uh, piercing his side, that uh, he went through that pain and he went through that agony, that uh, he would be a one-time sacrifice for each one of us as we partake of the bread Help us to remember the uh, body that uh, was hurt uh, and the body that Jesus gave up, that we might uh, have our sins forgiven, that we might have salvation through him. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The blood that flows through all of our veins
is that which carries everything to every part of our bodies. Our bodies don't work without the blood circulating through and moving oxygen, moving uh, dissolved food, moving gases that need to uh, come in and get out of the body. Uh, it's all, it all takes place within this blood. And uh, Jesus was willing to shed that blood for us because if our blood is shed to a great extent, uh, we are no longer able to carry on life's functions. And that's what happened to Jesus in a physical way, though death could not hold him uh, in that very, very physical way uh, through the uh, torture of the crucifixion, through the shedding of his blood. Jesus gave up his life that we might live. Help us to remember that uh, this blood is what uh, indeed washes away our sins. Please uh, forgive us uh, and uh, help us to understand the depth of Jesus' love as we partake of this fruit of the vine. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And finally, uh, this part of the service could be literally at any part of the service. We've just uh, kind of put it together with the communion service. But it's the part of the service when we give back to the Lord that which we have been blessed. And so uh, reckoning that the scriptures tell us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, that uh, the Lord wants us to feel gratitude in the blessings of life, and the knowledge that all great and wonderful things come from him. Let us take this opportunity to give back to the Lord uh, that which with we have been prospered. Help us to remember our prosperity and reflect that in our giving. Let's pray. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that we have to give. We thank you that... Uh, we have come to this part of the service where we think about that giving, where we think about uh, how much the Lord means to us and how much that uh, uh, we love him. And because we do, we give back to the church that he gave up his life for. As the cornerstone of the church, uh, Jesus uh, stands tall and uh, let's uh, help the church to uh, perform its mission here on earth with the funds that are given back to it. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And the last song we'll sing is number 273. 273. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. I hope that you enjoyed the song service as much as I did. Uh, it's a favorite part of uh, uh, my worship to the Lord. I hope that it's important to you that we give praise to God who gives us literally everything that we have. Uh, if you were there this morning, uh, you heard the title of our lesson this evening, and you probably wondered, what is this guy up to this time uh, with this kind of unusual title? And uh, hopefully, as we make our way through this short lesson this evening, that uh, the name of the title will make some sense to you and uh, hopefully uh, we will glean something from this lesson that we can take with us, that we can ponder during the week, that we can reflect on some of the scriptures that are used within the lesson 
uh, that uh, we can be uplifted by it. And so very, very simply put, the title of the lesson this evening is two. And that two being the number T-W-O. When I uh, put this lesson together, uh, I couldn't help but think of my generation as it reflects in the music that I have listened to over the years. And in uh, 1968, a man by the name of Harry Nielsen, who kind of dropped his first name and just went by uh, Nielsen, wrote a song. And the song was titled, One. Now, he didn't have the great big hit with the song. A year later in 1969, a group that uh, those of you again in my generation uh, know of as Three Dog Night, put out a song which was called One is the Loneliest Number. And uh, I don't know, through the magic of Google, yeah, you might want to uh, uh, go back to that song. They were certainly uh, uh, a really uh, a good singing group and uh, there are probably some songs that uh, you can rattle off and think about and the tunes can rumble around in your head. But uh, this one, was entitled, One is the Loneliest Number. And since two is the next number, uh, I thought this might be a good segue into the lesson this evening. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9, Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. Very often, uh, when uh, uh, plows would be pulled back in the old days, uh, pulled by animals, either oxen or horses or mules, um, the farmer uh, could get much more productivity if he uh, uh, latched two animals together and had them pull the plow. Uh, they could exert a, a much greater force and much, much more uh, could be accomplished with two rather than one. Hence, uh, maybe Solomon's wisdom in Ecclesiastes that said two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, we know uh, Jesus sent out his disciples on what has become known to us as the limited commission. This is the, not in opposition to, but you know, when we think of uh, the very, very end of the book of Matthew and the very, very end of the book of Mark, Matthew 28, Mark 16, we think of what was called the Great Commission where Jesus said, go out, all authority has been given to me, go out into all the world. Well, in, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent his disciples out and he sent them out in twos. Now, two can also give someone options. It can give folks a choice. Now, I spent uh, my uh, adult life uh, in the teaching profession. And as a teacher, I made up tests. Um, many times uh, on the test, I would uh, make up true and false questions. And so the student, in looking at the true and false statement, had to determine, had to make one out of two choices. And so this statement was either yes, it was true, or no, the statement was false. Two choices. Sometimes there were multiple choice questions where more than one choice, maybe two or three or even four choices were given. But I didn't want to get ahead of myself with 
many multiple choice, I, I want to fix it at two. Because after all, that's the title of this lesson. And so we want to uh, emphasize this number two in the lesson this evening. And so that was the emphasis that Jesus gave to the number two. Jesus felt like if his disciples went out in twos, it was almost like using a term of jargon that we've been using for years. One could have the other's back, right? Uh, and could be a, a backup of sorts. And so that is the emphasis that we find in the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. And this might be something that you want to take with you this evening, because most of the focus will come from the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew. And again, the number two will take prominence. In Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, Jesus uttered these words, Matthew seven, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and they are few who find it. The most serious choice that each of us have to make in our life is the choice of two paths, either the broad path or the narrow path. The broad path leads to destruction. It's an easier path to follow, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. The narrow path leads to eternal life. You know, uh, uh, Robert Frost uh, talked about the road less traveled, and the traveler had a choice of two paths which he would go. And the traveler took the path that was less traveled. Now, I don't know if Frost had God's or Jesus' words in mind here, but if you remember the poem, he says, I took the path less traveled, and the words echo through time. It says, and that has made all the difference. If we make the proper choice, the narrow path rather than the broad path, it will make all the difference for you and I also. The, the broad way is so easy to follow because it's the way that most folks are traveling. It, it's so easy and it's so tempting to join the crowd. Now, by the way, understand, sometimes the crowd is right, right? So let's not just say because there are many that uh, it can't be the right way to go. However, the broad way is so easy because what it allows is, it allows for us to do what we please. You know, um, we can be our own boss. We can do what we want to do. We're not restricted by the space, the narrower space. You know, for a lot of people, it goes against their nature to have someone tell them or us what we're supposed to do. We like to think that we're totally independent thinkers and we can do this all by ourselves. We can make our own decisions. The words of Jeremiah echo through my uh, mind when I say this. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, 
the prophet said, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah is saying, if you're going to walk your steps, walk them with the Lord. Have a tandem walk. Don't walk on your own. Don't follow the, the large crowd. Make your path the path that walks with the Lord. It's so sad sometimes to see friends and even family rushing down that broad path because it's so easy and sometimes things seem brighter and more glittery. All right, still in the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew, let's talk about the two foundations. In the same context of what we talked about, uh, you know, the narrow way and the broad way, if we go down, oh, close to uh, seven, eight, nine verses, Jesus said these words. He compares one's life to the building of a house. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. It goes on to say, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Jesus is talking about more than houses, isn't he? This is a wonderful metaphor about the way we build our lives. You know, in the song that we sing, a children's song, we're told to build our house on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the rock and he's the foundation. It's with our, our walk with Jesus Christ that we can be sure that no matter if the winds blow, no matter if the floods come, if the waters rise, we have Jesus at our side. Jesus is the rock of our foundation. If we don't, if we allow ourselves to go through that broad way, the easy way, it's like building our house on the sand. When the wind blows, we have nothing to protect the house. And remember, Jesus ends it by saying, and great was its fall. Now, when we examine this, we, say, we see that both men heard the word of God. It's how they choose to utilize that word of God that is important. One acted on it. One heard the word of God and said, this is my foundation. This is the rock of my foundation. He took the word and he said, this word means everything to me. This word, these Holy Spirit inspired words are the words of life. I'm going to take them into my life and make them the, the instructions by which I live my life day by day. And so that house stood while the other fell. See, hearing is not enough. 
what we have to do after we read and after we hear the Lord's word is we need to act upon it. Now, you know what? Years of living and depending how long uh, you've been on the face of the earth, um, many storms will come into our lives. When there are no storms and things are going along so nicely and so easily, we have a tendency very often to forget why they are uh, going along so nicely and easily, and we forget you know, who is guiding our way and who is guiding our path. It's when the storm hits, that's when we say, uh-oh, what do I do now? I've reached a, a somewhat of an impasse in my life. Years of living bring all kinds of storms. Now, not only will the Lord's word lead us to eternal life, but it will enable us to bear up under the storms of life. It will give us the chance for preparation. If you've ever seen places that are subject to storms like hurricanes, like this, this little uh, thing that's heading up the shore right now, um, uh, when people know that the storm is going to hit uh, and they live along the coast, if they have a boat, they get the boat out of the water. If they know the, the storm is going to be great, sometimes they nail plywood over their windows. Uh, they try to bring everything that would blow away, they, they try to tie it down. I remember several years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey, um, you know, uh, we, we had... Uh, you know, it was in the fall. We have chairs and, you know, lawn furniture all around. And you, you can't just, you know, th there isn't a place to just store it. And so I got rope and I literally intertwined the rope between the chairs, tied them uh, to a couple of big trees in preparation for the winds so that uh, all of this would not be uh, devastated. The Lord's word is the preparation that we need. It's telling us, you know what? Life isn't always smooth. Storms may come up and it will enable us to bear up under the storms of life. And you know what? We've lived through a pandemic and, you know, in many ways with this new Delta a variant. Uh, we're almost still in the middle of it. Uh, it brought uh, death to between 600 and 700,000 people. Maybe you know some people very personally who have gotten very sick, maybe even some who have died as a result of the COVID. You know, it, it was a, a horrible time. All of you that have lived through this over the past year, year and a half, uh, know how your life has changed, how the things that you do and the places that you go just kind of got turned on end. Well, we need to understand that through all of this, God is still in charge. It doesn't change the way our godliness works. Regardless of the pandemic, we were still to live godly lives. It didn't turn our lives so inside out that we did not know what we were to do. We were still to walk down God's path. So as we conclude this lesson this evening, I'd like us to think of three different things about this idea of two. First, we are indeed blessed to have the word of God. But unless we act upon what we hear, we're no better off if we did not have his word at all. We cannot let our Bibles become a coffee table book. 
You know, you know what those are, those beautiful books that we have sitting on our coffee table um, right around the corner from me, those pictorial books, you know, the ones that you, you just kind of open up and you, you thumb through them. You, you don't get any, any instruction out of them. They're just pretty. Well, you know what? Bible's nice, but it's not pretty. It's a book that is to be used. And so we must read the word of God and we must act upon it. Second, we know that storms will come in to our lives. The greater the storm we face, the more we need God's word in our life to show us the way. All right? The greater the storm, we have to choose the rock of our salvation. We have to build upon the rock and not the sand. We must make that choice of the two choices. We must make the choice of the narrow path rather than the broad path. And third, the church is an evangelizing agent. Part of what we do, part of what we say, and part of what we stand for is to persuade family and friends to go down the same path that perhaps that, that road less traveled, to turn to the Lord and his directions, to, to help those around us, to do what we have done, to build our life upon the rock, to make the choice of the narrow way because the broad way leads to destruction, the narrow way leads to eternal life. Building our life upon the rock leads us to eternal life. Building our, our life on the sand leads us to destruction. And it's okay to use Robert Frost's words if, if they inspire you a little bit. The, the narrow path building upon the rock is not what everyone does. It is taking the path less traveled. And when we do that, when we make that decision in our life, The Bible says it leads to eternal life. Frost said it has made all the difference. Taking the correct path, building upon the rock, all take us down the right path, the path that leads to eternal life. I hope these words were uh, inspiring to you. You have some scriptures. Uh, you have the Ecclesiastes scripture, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. You have Matthew chapter 7 where um, uh, Jesus talked about the narrow gate and the broad gate. We have Matthew also chapter 7 building our house upon the rock and not upon the sand. We, we have these verses. Uh, we have the scripture from Jeremiah that says we need to walk with the Lord. We know that it's not in man himself to walk on our own, but use God to direct our steps. The only way that God will direct our steps is if, is it, is if we take him into our lives. If we make God a permanent fixture in our lives, if we develop a strong and powerful relationship with God. And when we do that, then we're on our way to taking the narrow, building on the rock, taking the road less traveled because it will make all the difference. So if you have not come to the Lord, confess that Jesus is the Son of God, if you've not repented of your former ways and be, been baptized for the remission of your sins, the invitation is open to you right now. If you know what you have to do, give us a call. Send an email. 
uh, let us know. We, were, we will be there to help you in a moment's notice. I pray that all of you will be well. Let's end our service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time that we've had to devote to you this evening. I pray that the message would be inspiring to each of us as we think of the decisions that we have in life. And you know what? Sometimes they are tough decisions, but we are to live the godly lives that you want us to live. It will, will require us to, to uh, take the narrow path that runs through your word. It, take, it will take us to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and his inspired word in our lives. And in this way, we may go down that path that is not as well traveled, and it will indeed make a difference in our lives. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we go through the evening. Help us that uh, when we put our head on the pillow, that uh, we will pray to the Lord that uh, he will guide us through the night and wake us up to a new day tomorrow where we can serve him. Bless us and be with us. Forgive us of our sins. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.